To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon and download our app OneFin to start learning on the go. Let's now quickly summarize whatever we have learned in Indies 36. Indies 36 deals with impairment of assets. Now, whenever we have to check for impairment of assets, we have to see whether there are any indicators of impairment. Under indicators, we learned internal indicators, external indicators and indicators related to investments in subsidiaries, etc. If there are indicators of impairment, then the entity is required to estimate recoverable amount. How, what is recoverable amount? Recoverable amount is higher of value in use and fair value less cost of disposal. What is value in use? Value in use is the present value of cash flows that the entity is expected to generate from use of the asset and ultimate disposal. Now, after you have computed the recoverable amount, you will have to compare the recoverable amount with the carrying amount. If the recoverable amount is greater than the carrying amount, there is no impairment. But if the recoverable amount is less than the carrying amount, there is an impairment. The difference between this recoverable amount and the carrying amount is called impairment loss. And we also understood that there are some assets which do not generate cash flows which are largely independent of other assets. In such situations, we will group assets and we will create something called a cash generating unit. Even for a cash generating unit, the principles of impairment testing are same. So, you will have to estimate the recoverable amount which is higher of value in use and fair value less cost of disposal and compare that with the carrying amount of the CGU or the cash generating unit. If at all the recoverable amount is less than the carrying amount, it will be recognized as an impairment loss. right? Now, when should we do this impairment testing? For other assets, you have to check at the end of each reporting period whether there are any indicators of impairment. If there are indicators of impairment, then you will carry out the impairment testing. But for three assets, that is goodwill, intangible asset with indefinite useful life and intangible assets which is not yet available for use, these have to be tested for impairment annually, at least annually. And the time period in which they are tested should be consisted from one year to the other. And also, if there are indications of impairment, you anyways will have to do the impairment testing for these assets as well, right? So, this is the broad context of how should we calculate impairment loss. If at all there is an impairment loss for an individual asset, we will recognize that impairment loss in the PNL. You will debit the PNL and you will credit the respective asset. After this, the depreciation amount will be based on the revised carrying amount. You will also have to re-estimate the remaining useful life and the residual value. If it pertains to a CGU, then in that case, first the impairment loss will be consumed by goodwill. So, whatever is the impairment loss will be written off against goodwill. You will credit goodwill and you will debit the PNL. Balance losses, if any, will be allocated to other assets in the CGU in the ratio of their carrying amount. Now, while doing this, you must ensure that the individual asset inside the CGU should not be shown below its recoverable amount, right? So, if at all after charging its share of impairment loss, one specific asset has fallen below its recoverable amount, you will restrict the impairment loss such that the carrying amount does not fall below recoverable amount. Any balance loss left over will be allocated to other assets. Okay. So, first you will take to goodwill, then you will write it off against individual assets in the ratio of their carrying amount. You will ensure that individual asset is not shown below its recoverable amount and also you will not show it at a negative value. Okay. Sometimes what may happen is whenever we are testing for impairment, we realize that the impairment loss is greater than the carrying amount of that asset. This may be a case where there are associated liabilities related to disposal. In that case, you will recognize that extra liability only if it is permitted by India's 37. That we'll understand separately as a part of India's 37. Okay. Now, coming to goodwill, whenever there is goodwill which is which arises at the time of business combination, you will have to allocate the goodwill to the CGUs or group of CGUs which are expected to get synergic benefit out of the business combination. And to whichever units you have allocated goodwill, you will have to test for impairment at least annually, right? So, you will have to test for impairment of goodwill along with the related cash generating units. 
we also understood about corporate assets which do not generate cash flows independently they are more like support system for remaining assets so because corporate assets do not generate cash flows independently you will have to allocate corporate assets to the various other assets or various other cash generating units and including the corporate assets you will have to test them for impairment now whenever you are allocating goodwill or allocating you know corporate assets and testing cash generating units for impairment you'll have to first see whether individual assets within that those cash generating units are impaired first test will happen at individual asset level and after that you will have impairment testing at the cash generating unit level now when it comes to estimating the value in use we'll have to prepare we'll have to look at cash flow forecast now whenever we have to estimate value in use which is present value of future cash flows we understood that we will estimate the cash flows based on management projections and forecast but at the most we will consider only 5 years of budgeted forecast and projections beyond that we will use only if it is justifiable otherwise you will restrict yourselves to 5 years period then after that you can use a growth rate which should not be greater than the long term industry growth rate growth rate of the organization based on the past and it can be a constant growth rate or it can be a declining growth rate but it cannot be an increasing growth rate sometimes you may assume that the growth rate can be zero as well whenever you are preparing cash flow forecast you also need to understand that we will prepare cash flow forecast on pre tax basis so we will not consider any taxation impact and when we are using the discount rate we will not consider any tax impact so the discount rate will also be a pre tax rate Though the standard provides multiple kind of discount rates, the most appropriate could be, uh, you know, weighted average cost of capital computed using the CAPM model, or it could be the incremental borrowing rate or any other rate which is reasonable. Generally, this information would be given to you in the question, right? Now, whenever we are preparing cash inflows and cash outflows, please note that cash inflows related to continuous use of that asset or CGUs. that must be considered existing assets must not be considered so if there is an existing debtor that must not be considered to arrive at the cash flow similarly liabilities which are already recognized that should not be considered when determining the cash flows what will be the future cash flows that has to be considered and also there are any expected improvements to which the management is not yet committed to even those improvements must not be considered when you carry out the improvement then you can consider the outflow as well as inflows related to efficiencies or future gains but till such time you will not consider future expected enhancement of that particular asset so basically you will estimate the cash flow of that asset based on its current condition as on today whatever is the condition based on that what will be the future cash flows right and in doing this as i told you you will not consider taxation even disposal proceeds you will not factor in what will be the taxation impact right you all of these cash flows will be discounted using that discount rate and you will arrive at present value which will be the value in use then we also understood about reversal of impairment losses and please note reversal of impairment loss is permitted only if there are indicators of reversals you cannot just recompute the value in use using the same cash flows same discount rate and say that recoverable amount is greater than the carrying amount and hence there is a reversal that is not permitted you have to see if there are indicators and based on these indicators you have to see if the estimates of recoverable amount have changed that is whether the estimates of value in use have changed or whether the estimates of fair value less cost of disposal have changed and once this change has been established only then you can reverse the impairment loss very important impairment loss on goodwill cannot be reversed impairment loss on goodwill cannot be reversed you will have to allocate the reversal amongst the remaining asset in which ratio in the ratio of their carrying amount in the ratio of their carrying amount you will reverse the impairment loss now here you have to do one more check that is to calculate the carrying amount of the specific asset assuming there has been no impairment and you have to ensure that after reversal the carrying amount of that asset should not be greater than the carrying amount had there been no impairment so to simply remember the maximum amount of reversal of impairment loss will be equal to the carrying amount without charging impairment and carrying amount after charging impairment loss whatever is this difference to the maximum of this amount you can reverse the impairment loss beyond this you cannot reverse the impairment loss and to goodwill you cannot reverse at all
Now, after determining the impairment loss or reversal of impairment loss, where should you recognize them? If there is impairment loss and the entity is following cost model, impairment loss will be recognized in PNL. Reversal of impairment loss will also be recognized in the PNL. If the entity is following a revaluation model, then impairment loss will be treated as if it is a downward revaluation and treated accordingly. Reversal of impairment will also be treated as if it is an upward revaluation and treated accordingly. Then we also spent some good time and understood the impact of goodwill impairment on non-controlling interest. If the entity is following proportionate share of net assets method, then you will have to gross up the goodwill and calculate the impairment loss accordingly. Right. So with this, we have covered broadly the various aspects related to impairment. What is important is, you know, a very good grip on the calculation related aspects, then this standard should not be scary at all for your examination, right? We'll have a look at one of the annual reports for impairment related disclosures and then we'll wind up the session.